I was muted. I would say we wait another maybe couple of minutes and then we start. I asked somebody if you want to answer. Was it easy to, to get to the call, to the link and the access to the session? Does anybody want to answer? This is the first question. This is for the participant. Was it easy to, to get in the Zoom call? Yeah, it was, uh, it was easy. And perhaps the tricky part was the, uh, the password. People are not mm -hmm. kind of used like the cup and paste the password from the invitation, mm -hmm. but it's straightforward, I believe. Okay, yeah. good. We were always afraid that <laughs> Zoom is yeah. not uh, working perfectly. Go ahead. Hello, hello, this Hi. is Maher. Maher from Syria. In fact, uh, the, thank you. Uh, in Syria, just uh, when um, uh, we use the Zoom link, we need to have VPN. So if the colleagues from Syria don't aware of, uh, about this, they won't get uh, the link uh, open. I hope people know this. I think that we can start just slowly, slowly. Anyway, we start with the introduction. And if people join in a few minutes, they will not uh, lose a lot, just some uh, brief introduction of the day today. So uh, a warm welcome to everyone. We are a lot today, <laughs> all together. Welcome to the interactive section organized by the Global Health Cluster with the support from the READY Initiative. I am Donatella Masai. I work for the Global Health Cluster COVID Task Team, and I will moderate this session today. Today, uh, we'll look at the tool. You see it on the screen on the left, ethics key question to ask when facing dilemma during COVID response in humanitarian setting. But we will also discuss several other aspects of ethical dilemma related to COVID response together with our panelists and with you. Uh, now, before diving into the content and the presentation, uh, to warm up, we are going to do an exercise. I don't know if you know, we're gonna use Slido. So this is, I'm gonna show you. So grab your phone, if you have a smartphone, I guess you have. Uh, the, put slido.com as you see here on the left on my screen. Can you see it? And then when you open it, it asks, you see exactly this screen, like on your phone, what you see on my screen on the left. When it say enter the code, you put ethic, one, no capital, no space. Ethics one. I think you'll see in the chat box also. And then there are a couple of questions um, that will just warm up and know each other a bit, uh, a bit better. If you encounter any problem in uh, reaching slido.com. I hope you don't because it's much fun. But uh, if you cannot, uh, please uh, answer the question in the in the chat box, and somebody will um, get your your answers. So I'm gonna stop sharing and getting. Look at this. Whoa, a lot of Washington. I promise I didn't put it. Washington, Atlanta, Canada, South Sudan, Turkey, South Sudan, Switzerland, Ireland, Dakar, one of my preferite places, uh, Zimbabwe, 
Japan, Pakistan, Syria. Wow, guys. Is anybody encountering problem? Is it easy? Brazil. Thank you, amazing. Uh, we're gonna go on the second question if you are ready, which is, are you familiar with the tool um, by the Global Health Cluster, the tool that I have shown before? Uh, and you should, yes, <laughs> quite clear. No, yes. I really hope that the yes will win, but. Go, go, vote, vote. So if people do not know, this is a great occasion <laughs> to represent Eva, you're gonna have, <laughs> and we're gonna have a lot of questions then. <laughs> wow, 32 person. Is there any in the chat box, uh, Paula? You're muted. No. Okay, so everyone, well, everyone feel pretty comfortable with the, with the, we have 34, we are 61, so about 50% answer. So we can, we can go back to our presentation. So Slido worked. So this is the tool I was, the one ethics key question to ask, this was the tool I was, um, we were asking for. It was really, really nice. Is even my first time on Slido. No, no, not my first time, but Slido, I think it's good. I hope you enjoy. We're going to use it um, later on for other questions and discussion. Um, before we start uh, with the presentation, let me provide some housekeeping information. They're really important. The session is recorded. And the link with the recording can be shared if you are interested, if you need it uh, from tomorrow on. Uh, the session is, as you have seen already probably, is in four languages, English, French, Spanish, and Arabic. And you can choose any language, uh, the, the language you prefer. Um, I will ask the panelists, but I see them already on video, to be on video at least when they present. And then again, for the course of all session, if you have questions, please use Slido. And instead of ethics one, you put ethics three in the, when you open the slido.com. And in the course of the whole uh, session today, you can ask questions and we will ask them, uh, we'll answer them at the end in the question and answer uh, session at the end. But if you have any burning uh, issue, question, please do not hesitate. We can, we can stop. Uh, otherwise, we'll go after at the end. Um, and I think we are ready now to present uh, the first panelist. Uh, let me introduce um, Professor Lisa Schwartz, who is the Arnold Johnson Chair in Healthcare Ethics at McMaster University. Professor Swartz is also a member of the MSF Ethics Review Board. Welcome. I stopped sharing, sorry. That's okay, good, thanks. I'm gonna to try to get my, my uh, slides up. We had a bit of a challenge with that earlier, but hopefully I'll figure this out. Um, so right now you're probably seeing a clear screen, is that right? Yeah. And if I begin my Present. presentation, which are you seeing now? Uh, not the full screen. Okay. That should work, yeah? Yes, perfect. Good, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and thanks everyone. First, I wanna say thanks to uh, Donatella and, and team for all the work that you've done and to um, acknowledge the partnership, the collaboration with Eva that, uh, that's brought us to this point. Um, and today, I, like I said in the chat earlier, I think what I'm gonna do is very simple for a start, um, but I think where we're, the complexities will come in is when we're discussing the case study and the 
um, the realities, I think, for all of you on the ground. So although I'm affiliated with the Ethics Review Board at McMaster, uh, sorry, at um, MSF, um, and also do work with WHO on uh, community engagement during um, COVID response, um, I, I am an academic most of the time and my background is in philosophy. So I'll rely on all of you for the contributions um, around the realities of things. Um, <clears throat> so we're looking at ethics and pandemic response and I think it hasn't been easy for anyone. Um, the pathway to making easy decisions or clear decisions is, is never something that, um, uh, you know, that was going to be possible from the start of the pandemic. I think we knew that there would be difficulties and there was a lot of panic at first. I think now we've begun to be um, uh, accustomed to some of those challenges. Um, but as somebody early on on Twitter, a colleague said, I'm not even sure which one it was, she said, you know, things are going to be bad when they start calling in the ethicists. Um, and so I think that's where we we got to is that as, as ethics consultants, we suddenly became very busy and um, and and very popular. Now I can't seem to advance my slide. There we go. Um, so some of you probably heard this term before. I'm sure it's not a new term to most of you. Uh, the notion of a, a syndemic. Um, so a syndemic uh, initially, I think, was meant to to describe the as the CDC puts it, the synergistically interacting epidemics. So when epidemics overlap with epidemics, um, but the interesting thing about a syndemic is that it really highlights questions of justice and actually the factors that create injustices um, uh, that that go beyond the biological and into the social factors. So I became interested in that idea of syndemic at that point where we were thinking um, not just about you know who could do well clinically in a um, uh, it, during the pandemic and, and due to COVID, but also what were the factors that were making it possible for some to fare better than others, and that included things like access to healthcare, um, access to good information and um, and education. Um, and then, of course, access to vaccines. And we've seen the disparity locally, but globally has been almost, um, well, I think probably unbearable for most of us to watch. <clears throat> Um, and I think that the idea of syndemic is particularly appropriate as a concept in humanitarian settings uh, because of the limitations that we live with all the time. There's always a crisis at the same time as other kinds of issues. And for the most part, um, questions of poverty, of displacement, um, natural disaster, lack of resourcing, all of those things come together to create not just you know, the, 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 the medical response that's needed, but the global humanitarian response. Uh, Lisa Tessman is a, an American philosopher. She referred to these things as imperfect moral contexts. And as a concept, I guess I think of it often in the humanitarian setting, that these imperfect settings that have a tendency to make it hard for us to do the right thing. And every time we feel that we're looking at the right direction, something thwarts it, you know, some obstacle comes up, some um, uh, moral imba imbalance. So one of the first things that happens, I think, is people start to feel frustrated um, at a loss. They think that they've lost control over the resources that they do have, like the personal resources for doing the right thing. Um, you know, in medical ethics, a lot of the times the doctors will rush to, you know, first their medical texts and their guideline statements and to do what they think is the right thing to do. Um, other times they look to the law, um, hoping that the law and things like inter the international um, humanitarian law, international health law, will help them solve problems that are, you know, uh, that, that are confounding, I guess, their medical um, understanding of the world. Um, and then they realize that there's more to it than that, that there are subtleties and nuances. So we recognize that we've got an ethical issue when the right thing to do is not obvious, um, or when it compromises some other significant commitment that we need to make, like a duty of care to everyone, as opposed to just those people who might be able to do well. 
Um, and so we're stuck in these imperfect moral contexts where there's a feeling that um, no matter what we do, we can't avoid doing some harm, that the moral wrongdoing is um, hard or even impossible to avoid. And we'll look at some case studies um, in a minute that I think bring this to reality. But as you're hearing this, I wonder if some of that is resonating with you, those moments where you thought, I just don't know what I can do, or I don't know where to turn to, um, or how to respond to this question. Um, we're lucky because uh, to a certain extent, <clears throat> we've got, um, uh, uh, sorry, we've got, um, I just noticed the chat come in. Uh, to a certain extent, we've got some, some tools, I guess, which um, we rely on, and these are the, the theories of ethics. Um, so I called this slide Philosophy 101. Some of you are probably familiar with some of these um, very Eurocentric, I, I admit, um, theories, um, but they're theories that I find uh, you know, sometimes help us guide or guide us um, by either illuminating or um, showing a sort of a new way to look at the problem. Um, so you're probably familiar with oops, utilitarianism. Um, utilitarianism is particularly concerned with outcomes. Um, what is it I'm trying to achieve? What am I hoping to do? Um, often it's associated with um, uh, uh, sort of the greatest good for the greatest number kind of reasoning. And when you're going into um, a disaster setting, particularly there's this desire to quickly save the most lives possible. So utilitarianism points us in that direction. Um, deontology, which is probably less familiar to some people, it comes back from Immanuel Kant. Um, deontology is focused on duties. In fact, the word deon is, is Greek for duty, so it's duty oriented. And that means that sometimes we have things that we want to do um, or outcomes we want to produce, but we also have our duties that guide us. Um, duties of, um, uh, uh, of non-abandonment, for example, duties of care to others, particularly when as human humanity you enter into that field, you immediately acquire some sort of a moral entanglement, which is a responsibility or a duty to other. The reason I like to talk about these two is, you know, in my classroom anyway, in Philosophy 101, um, sometimes look at these two as potentially conflicting. So if your duties, if you know what your duties are, what you're responsible to do, because you have the guidance, you have your professional organizations, you have this responsibility to others, um, if that doesn't coincide with creating the best outcomes, um, let's say, you know, trying to preserve the most lives possible, um, then you have a proper moral dilemma, right? So I know what I'm supposed to do, but if I do it, it's going to cause some harm. Um, or I'm trying to create the best outcomes possible, um, so I might have to do something that isn't necessarily aligned with my duties in order to achieve it. So we look at those two, these duties and outcomes, as a useful way of thinking about where am I in the problem? Um, am I looking at my duties and seeing that they don't correspond with possible outcomes? Then I've got that moral dilemma. Another, another theory that's, uh, that's well known, and I noticed doc uh, Dr. Uh, Gayath Hussain is on the call with us. So we've been having a, a debate on Twitter about principalism, not really a debate, but I think we are recognizing that principalism is useful, but it has a, people have a tendency to rely on it very heavily. Um, and it's great because what principalism does is it identifies principles or values or statements that we really want to believe in and that we cling to. So we might say in, in healthcare, Care, often that's autonomy, um, non-maleficence, uh, beneficence, and justice. But in, of course, the humanitarian setting, we have things um, like neutrality, humanity, um, impartiality, right? These are principles that are stated that we, um, as professionals, have to align ourselves with. The problem with principalism is that while it gives us a good common vocabulary and a sense of what's important to people, it doesn't tell us whether we've A, got the right principles or the only principles that we should follow, or B, um, very importantly, <clears throat> it doesn't tell us what to do when two principles conflict. So is there a hierarchy? Should one take, it, um, take priority over others? And we'll see how that might play out in the context of the case studies in a little bit. 
Very importantly though, um, you know, ethics doesn't offer all the solutions. And I was, I was apprehensive coming on this call today as I was preparing because um, I can't tell you the right thing to do. Um, and particularly when the right thing to do is really hard to find. Um, I'm not sure if any of the theories will give us, you know, clear cut, easy answers. They give us tools to think of, to, to use to think about, but not the pathway to the right answer. And so in those circumstances, when, you can, when the answer is hard to find, when the right thing to do is hard to identify, um, we also rely on something else we call procedural ethics. So process is really important. And how we find the right process um, and establish that process can really help to make sure that people feel that they're included, that their voices have been heard. Um, it allows for better buy-in um, and gives you a, um, other possibilities uh, that you might not think of when you're, when you're alone. So process, as I've said, is important when it's a collective approach, um, when it involves things like inclusivity and is oriented towards equity. And the um, toolkit, oh, sorry, and I have to say, um, I'll just point out that it's not going to be easy, particularly the inclusivity part. I hear people say, how do I find out whose voices, who should be included? Um, it, it may not be easy, but um, like I said, I don't think your work is ever easy. And I admire your persistence as you, you know, as you slog through that. Um, so this might just be another factor, but you also have community um, uh, contacts, uh, you do your, your um, community integrative work, uh, community engagement, um, and probably even have some community advisory boards that could help inform some of this difficult decision making. And I urge you to rely on them the way that we've been doing um, in uh, the uh, randomized control trials that WHO is, is, is leading, that we're leaning heavily on existing community advisory boards to help give us insights on what works and what doesn't work. Um, as just sort of foundational questions, I always come back to these ones. Um, you know, the first question of whatever it is that I'm going to do as I'm making my plans, who could be harmed by it? And we might think about the immediate harms to people who might not get something, but also the long-term harms, the kind of um, disinterest or disenfranchisement that happens when a group of people are told you're not going to get your way this time. Um, and I think we're seeing this heavily in the you know, anti-vax kind of orientations, the distrust, I guess, to um, healthcare that sometimes it's because people felt that they haven't been heard um, or that their concerns haven't been adequately met. So we wanna know who could be harmed and how can we mitigate those harms? We also want to know who's going to benefit. Um, so not just looking at the harms, but are we um, adequately sharing the benefits that could come from the decision itself? Um, and is it always the same people who are benefiting or should we be thinking about expanding that base of benefits? Um, and then we can also ask ourselves the question, if we don't act here, if we don't do anything, is that okay? Sometimes it is, and sometimes it's not. So given the, um, the case study that's coming up and some of the difficulties that we've been talking about, particularly around equity, I wanted to share this quote with you, which is one that I use um, over and over again with my students um, and that I keep coming back to. It's from 1967 and forgive me, it's, you know, it's, it's again, it's kind of uh, Anglo-centric and it's also um, sexist in the language. So I'll just alter that as I read it. Um, uh, M.H. Papworth in the, the realm of, of research Ethics said, no physician is justified in placing science or the public welfare first and their obligation to the individual who is their patient or subject second. No doctor, however great their capacity or original their ideas, has the right to choose martyrs for science or for the general good. And I think we can just as easily substitute, you know, polit politician or um, uh, humanitarian actor uh, for physician in this case, and knowing that we can't, we don't have the right to choose um, uh, martyrs for the for the general good. 
Um, so always thinking about those interests. Um, I'm just so glad that Eva um, had, had come to us, myself and uh, Dr. Matthew Hunt, we contributed to the development of this tool that really was led by Eva and the team um, at the Health Cluster. And um, I'm glad we get a chance to share it with you because it provides um, both a process um, as well as key information for making um, decisions in this field. And these are some references and some resources. So thanks very much. And if you're interested in finding out more about humanitarian health ethics, you can find us at the website there. Right, now I'm gonna to try to stop sharing. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. <laughs> Schwarz. Thank you for the incredible presentation. Um, now, uh, if you're not tired yet, we're gonna do another <laughs> interactive exercise on Slido. This time, a couple of questions about your own experience. Um, so is you still go on Slido and you insert ethics too. I think you can see in the chat box. So the first question sorry, the first question is in your work, have you faced a dilemma? Uh, of course we refer to COVID-19. Uh, response where you had to make a decision or follow a decision that you thought still was unfair or unjust or had some kind of negative consequence, but was still probably the best and only option to follow. Wow. This confirmed that this kind of online session and webinar are important. I don't know, this is what is telling to me. Wait a few seconds more, although we are a bit late. Just wanna give the opportunity to everyone to contribute. And the second question is, can you describe, so a couple of words doesn't have to be long, uh, some dilemma you have faced. I think you have seen in the presentation of, Dr. of Professor Schwartz uh, some of the issue um, and, and, and you have your, most of you have experience. Uh, workforce management will have a, a brief presentation on that inequity. Priority group for vaccination, of course. No mask for, yeah, I know IPC material has been an issue from the beginning. Policy restriction, blind leadership, triage. And pretty much any resource allocation decision. Yes, I'm, I'm almost, almost like this one, uh, summarize all of them. Pandemic fatigue has an excuse, uh, but not only it is a fatigue, it has been, and it is very hard. Distribution of small remote population having, sorry, a small population having big outbreak. Yes. Wow, great. Thank you. So COVID isolation, I could stay here forever, but uh, you can <laughs> keep, I mean, the, the, um, this is still open. So you can stay on ethics too and keep posting your, we're gonna analyze at the end uh, and hopefully uh, with other information, we're gonna uh, make all what you share with us uh, important information for how to do better next time and how to be inclusive obligation to subordinate to keep all the time put on their mask sometimes with sanctions mm -hmm. it's true some countries mm -hmm. i would say so you can continue uh, to to post your question anytime reaching those left behind yes this is almost our work all the time uh, in humanitarian setting. 
Thank you so much for, it, it, it's really great. Thank you for your, and so now we have, we see already the presentation. Uh, we have now with us, everybody knows her. So I don't almost need to introduce her. Heba Pasha, Global Health Cluster COVID Task Team Focal Point. And she will present the tool that we have seen before, key question to ask when facing dilemma during the COVID-19 response humanitarian setting, a people-centered approach. Please, Eva. I'm trying to unmute. <laughs> so we've gone through some, and I hopefully have unmuted now, but uh, we've obviously all faced lots of dilemmas during, um, during COVID-19 response or humanitarian response in general. So I won't go through that. Uh, but as we go through the tool, I just ask you to focus on one of those examples that you've uh, uh, personally felt or experienced and, um, and then use that for the steps as we go forward. So just something about the tool itself. It was developed by people who already developed standards in humanitarian settings. So Sphere, heavily involved in it, co-wrote this. Global Protection Cluster co-wrote this. So these are people who you know, talk about people-centered approaches, accountability for affected populations. We have a position paper on quality of care. It aligns to all of this. So these really aren't new principles. We're not coming up with anything new. It's just with what we already have a commitment to doing in humanitarian response. How, um, how can we do that when we're in, uh, facing a quandary? Quandary is an understatement. Now I'm trying to go ahead. So why should we use a tool? And Lisa's already told, said this, but it's really, <laughs> and we know we do this every single day in humanitarian response. You guys, frontline workers do. We need to maintain public trust especially when we're doing horrible, hard things. We need to make sure whatever we do when we face that situation, that it's consistent and equally applied. What I mean by that is it's not going to change because it's me one day and my friend another day. It's not going to change that decision or outcome isn't going to change because it's someone which or my family that are walking through. It's not going to be dependent on ad hoc things but we have a consistent systematic approach. So we can trust in whatever that system is. We have to be transparent, we have to engage communities, but of course they have to be allowed to challenge our decisions as well. Mm -hmm. And if there's one thing that we must walk away from this webinar is that frontline workers should never be left alone to deal with a horrible situation. That is absolutely, whether it's, and that's clear in CHS standards, uh, organizational uh, duty of care, to our staff, but they, we know there's burnout, we know there's distress, we know people are having to make these horrible decisions and they need that support, but they shouldn't have to make these decisions by themselves. So this is kind of like the eight steps within the toolkit. It comes from other toolkits as well, which Lisa's been heavily involved with, but we really just made the flavor it in line with sphere and accountability to affected populations about humanitarian principles. And we just kind of incorporated that kind of language. So number one is, is it an ethical dilemma? I mean, if you've got, if out of all of your response options, one of them is pretty good, that's not really a dilemma. That's like, okay, well, there's lots of options that there's actually a good outcome here. But if all your possible scenarios are horrible and cause some kind of harm or inequity, then, you know, it's, a it's an ethical dilemma. You need to work out what are the pros and cons in each, what are the ethical principles you don't have to go down a very deep line but you know am I helping the individual or the community what what is the rationale behind all of this and very importantly given our privilege uh, our status what are our own biases compared to the community who is actually having to make these decisions address the dilemma is it your front frontline healthcare worker by themselves is it everyone is it the health cluster and obviously from the health cluster point of view, we are a community, we are health cluster partners, we are a sector, we have a collective responsibility. Uh, is it individual organizations, Ministry of Health, who is it? Who's having to make those decisions? And then again, as Lisa said before, who's being affected by it? Are certain groups being affected more than another? And if so, how or why? Um, what is the community perception about this dilemma? And this is really, really critical that we probably, I don't know, <laughs> is the toughest of them all. How much are they really informed or understand what the different options are? Do they really understand what the dilemma is? 
if they're being rejected from uh, healthcare facilities for COVID-19 because there's no beds. Do they understand what those issues are? People are being turned away in India, Bangladesh, in many countries when we have the Delta wave, first wave. Um, do they know why they're being turned away? Are they, um, what do they think about all these different response options that are available? Do they think some are actually acceptable? Do they think it's not acceptable? Do they trust us? Do they trust the healthcare provider? Do they trust the government who's making these decisions? And importantly, what's, well, I've always got about mm -hmm. democracy, but that's my own cultural bias. Are they able to engage in this process, the discussion we're having about whatever issue it is, and think about that issue that you've just written about, were people, were the community able to engage in discussing what those options are and what they think works or not? So now we go, now we've kind of defined what the situation is, what determining a way forward. Again, the only key takeaway I really want from all of this is frontline healthcare worker, frontline worker cannot be left alone to deal with the situation. So when they're facing it, even if it's in real time right now, who can help in that situation? Well, within the organization, obviously we all have duty of care. So if there's one worker, they should be able to have a supervisor they can talk to. They should be able to talk to the country team, HQ, whatever it is, but uh, within the organization, you all have a responsibility to support uh, dealing with a the dilemma. There may be other organizations, uh, probably other organizations facing the same issue. And as such, as a health cluster, and this is me as Global Health Cluster, we are saying, we also have a collective duty to be able to have that conversation and come up with a position on it. Do we need further advocacy with perhaps the humanitarian country team or the national authorities? This is also avenues that we can do. Uh, but of course, throughout this, we need to be engaging the communities. So what is it that we need to do? Number one, we need to create that environment to collectively discuss that horrible situations uh, are presenting to us. And we need to come up with a way. Um, we need to allow for that environment to be a place where we can all at least discuss it. Uh, again, going back to the same thing, this is going to be on repeat. If someone is facing uh, having to make a decision frontline and in the immediate uh, moment needs to de uh, decide, they really need to have someone, a point of contact senior within the team who they can have this conversation with. It shouldn't be an individual discussion ever, even if it's about case management protocols, if it's about closing down clinics, if it's running out of bed suddenly at uh, 4 p.m. or 11 p.m. at night, whatever it is, uh, there needs to be that mechanism within the organization within us to be able to reach out for support. But again, especially in COVID-19, especially in humanitarian response, we're often all facing this together. So organizationally, we have the options of creating SOPs and doing further advocacy. Um, I'm going to try and go through quick stop check. Uh, once you've decided how you're going to do this, do you need any more information about vulnerable groups, people at risk? I'm trying to whisk through this because I want to get to uh, the case study afterwards, which Dr. Dan will be doing. But uh, again, what are these? Uh, uh, how can we collectively uh, determine an appropriate solution? So one way um, is, of course, creating a working group and Dr. Dan, um, the health cluster coordinator from South Sudan, who was previously in Cox's as well, will go through that with you. But together, you need to be reviewing the situation. Together, you need to be analyzing those pros and cons. And together, you need to decide on a best option and be super honest about who's going to lose out in this. Because by understanding who's going to lose out, you can hopefully, you might not be able to, put in some mitigation measures for those. For example, those who are being uh, turned away from healthcare facilities. What can we do for home-based care? What can we do for home-based palliative care? What does that look like? Do we need other sectors? Do we need other people? Um, so being honest about that um, decision is the most important so that you can decide those um, uh, contingencies afterwards. So what are the next steps other than, you know, making sure you use the SOP and the advocacy? Throughout this process, we need to be engaging with those communi uh, communities, understanding how they're feeling about it, understanding their uh, incorporating their feedback into your decision making. 
on what the response option is, um, but also have that feedback mechanism. They have the right to challenge us on uh, whatever the decision that is. Uh, and this is a basic AAP principle. Uh, but the second big important thing is we need to make sure our frontline workers who may be distressed by what uh, they're having to, the decisions they're having to either follow or make themselves, we need to make sure we have an environment uh, mm -hmm. and the skills and capacity uh, to give them that support. So I'm just going to leave it there and hand over back to Donatella. Eva, thank you so much. Thank you not only for your presentation, but for your leadership in developing this tool. Thank you. Um, we have different options. So I will, I will um, now briefly promise, very briefly, because we are very late and we want to have space at the end for questions. Dr. Aisha Malik was sick today, so I will briefly introduce mental health and psychosocial support um, to the healthcare workers. It's probably somehow already included partially in what Iba has presented, but let's speak about the risk uh, for, um, for, for healthcare workers' mental health uh, during COVID-19. I think you, you have already mentioned in the list of the things you put in Slido, but let's mention a few of them. It's higher demand in the work setting, of course. Increased witness to suffering and deaths, very hard. Increased volume of clinical services leading to overburdening. I think you have all, almost of all, experienced this. Tension between public health priorities and patient wish, uh, wishes and Dr. Schwartz um, present about this, and overall a situational anxiety. Uh, we all at a higher risk of infection, as has healthcare workers, our family, and our communities. Healthcare workers' mental health should be prioritized to be able to support their capacity to work. Um, uh, both in the long term, but as well in the short term crisis response. Uh, it's almost like the mask in the airplane. You, we have to treat and make sure our health staff is healthy and mentally fitted to be able to work and support others. Uh, another important concept, and I repeat, Iba has already mentioned partially, is what is the management role? And I think in this call, we have a lot of managers and I'm sure you are doing this or if you have resources, part of it. And the manager should assess and minimize additional COVID-related occupational psychosocial risk for stress, ensure access to and provision of mental health and psychosocial support for healthcare workers mm -hmm. if it's not in place. Promote a culture where healthcare workers feel comfortable in seeking health. This is another very important thing. Train health leads um, in basic psychosocial skill and regular supporting monitor of staff and their mental well-being. Very often we give as a grant that healthcare staff is able to support mental health, but it is not the need training. And I repeat one thing because I really think it's important is the concept that Iba has repeated two times and I will repeat a third time is that no frontline workers should be left alone to take difficult decision and everybody should know where and how to get the needed support to do better next time or to do better while you are working. Um, I conclude here my presentation, I promise, short. And I would like now to give the floor to Dr. Mukesh Prajapti, who is the health cluster coordinator in South Sudan and was previously co in Kok Bazar. Uh, he will present addressing ethical dilemmas during COVID-19 response in humanitarian setting, a case study in Kok Bazar, Bangladesh in 2020. Uh, please, Dr. Mukesh. 
Thank you so I much. Thanks, thanks, Donald, Thank Donald Dilla, Professor Lisa, and Eba for excellent presentation. You made you make my life very easy to just go through with uh, uh, what we passed through and how we followed uh, unconsciously or consciously these principles or where we haven't followed. Uh, I'm trying to. Uh, it looks like I don't have access to sh share the screen. Can I host? Oh yeah, that's very great. Um, so let's go to first slide. This is a, okay. So as Donatella mentioned that my name is Dr. Mukesh Pajapati. I'm a cluster cluster coordinator, uh, currently based in South Sudan. Uh, I used to be in Cox Bazaar, uh, where, you, where we, uh, Cox Bazaar, uh, we said health sector. I, uh, and uh, when uh, COVID-19 struck, uh, I used to, uh, to lead the, and coordinate the health sector uh, together with all uh, partners, uh, WHO, uh, and, and other colleagues, also with uh, ob, uh, at the observers, MSF and Red Cross family. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what I'm presenting is already there in uh, in uh, in the guidance note, um, which Eba has uh, described uh, briefly, um, and exactly where we were also looking at when when it first struck, I still remember 8 February when we met uh, key organization together to uh, what to how to deal with the disease, which we don't know. We, we don't didn't have a guidance. We didn't have a, um, any how to prevent, uh, uh, how to approach. Um, and during at that time, right from there up to the middle of the 2020, um, we were in in long long dilemma individual versus population healthcare healthcare when there is no guidance or little guidance available um lockdown at that time uh, when i'm talking about first and second quarter of 2020 it was very new no uh, lockdown no lockdown mixed uh, localized lockdown which mask when we started 8 february when preparing for largest uh, refugee mm -hmm. Camp in Cox Bazaar. We started preparing for COVID-19. We had a very limited uh, uh, N19 mask and um, and surgical mask, a few which is uh, uh, which uh, has been procured by in a kits to provide uh, regular services. And we don't we didn't we didn't know how to make a cloth mask. Um, and uh, and then PPE were almost uh, not there. Um, those who we, it was very few in order to um, deal with thanks to peer pandemic preparedness uh, that uh, um, projects uh, which we used to have a uh, few PPEs. And so during that time to make a decision was not easy. This time we can say that oh which mask uh, to wear everybody knows. At that time what which mask to wear in midst of uh, spreading infection it was very it was not easy which where where is a patient's choice uh, some patients um, uh, go decline totally decline not to even uh, taste not to go to the service um, and and then during that dilemma that how we continue providing services and prevent uh, covid 19 infections prioritize treatment treatment versus spreading of the disease how to convince community that um, what is required in order not to treat uh, also but also to uh, prevent uh, spreading infection um, and uh, when the response started uh, middle of the 2020 what about essential services immunization no one was uh, uh, taking services and it was almost like a um, uh, stop services elective surgeries deliveries uh, and then uh, what precautions needs to be taken it was not easy time there and finally health and livelihood what to choose health or or um, to have a regular income next 
and then and that's how we face dilemma in uh, largest uh, world's largest refugee camp uh, where uh, around 750000 population was housed in crowded conditions uh, um, in cox bazar where health sector was leading uh, health uh, um, uh, along and uh, other uh, sectors were under uh, intercluster coordination intersectoral coordination mechanism um, we in, uh, decided at that time that health sector all response will be under the leadership of health sector and um, situation was that we uh, when we came into this dilemma and this case study what what describes is that we were expecting overwhelming capacity we um, uh, we had a national protocols which requires all all patients to be admitted we have suspected confirmed all patients um then uh, we have a community feedbacks uh, uh, some are not willing to use uh, community facilities uh, even if they are very sick um there is also host population around um, uh, 500000 more uh, uh, 700 here uh, refugees 500 more close to 1.3 million population and host population um, home isolation was a bit easier than uh, uh, than camp and protocols is a national protocols which apply to everyone so how to differentiate between uh, now uh, for refugee population and host population next and this was dilemma that what is the best uh, way to manage patients how when we overwhelm uh, with the situations when where sari facilities are not uh, um, enough when all uh, sari is sari uh, severe acute respiratory infection treatment uh, beds when all beds are full what we how we deal with this um, uh, this large influx of the patients um, and at that time we were preparing uh, we had almost like um, um, 750 beds uh, first, uh, in in 13 centers uh, 12 to 13 centers were ready we were expecting as per uh, having uh, um, uh, using a day different models we were expecting triple triple uh, number of cases um, and limited resources are available and we have to see that what best we can provide um, best uh, treatment can be provided uh, it's not individual but, but to the communities and both host community and uh, and uh, and um, refugee community next um, and then that's what uh, dilemma if you uh, come across this guidelines and you read benefits beneficence uh, uh, in terms of for the patient beneficence for the population uh, utility um, doing good for the most of the people um, and and uh, also liberty looking at uh, patient's choice community's choice so each and every aspect of this um, ethics ethics uh, ethical principles has been challenged and in midst of this we have to take decision next so we have uh, now options uh, we had only three options available um, and uh, and then here like we admit all patients irrelevant of the severity and uh, when hospitals when in hospitals all beds are full then uh, we will not admit any patients uh, even it is a uh, mild severe or critical second option was to prioritize home based care for mild and moderate and we admit critical cases this is about uh, admitting patients in the covid-19 treatment facilities option 3 was uh, as with option 2 but uh, also prioritize severe cases to be home uh, to have home based care depending on risk factors and on the level of uh, uh, support needed so um, we continue option 2 but then also treat critical patient at uh, home and this is because it is not that we didn't want to treat but then uh, patients uh, beds are not available what to do with uh, uh, with severe cases uh, in and this in this context then we choose next slide please we choose option 2 uh, where um, and then choosing option 2 we finalized the sop standard operating procedures among ourselves uh, um, and then we made a decision collective decision at that time that if treatment centers reach 75% of bed occupancy 
or 1500 suspected cases so this is like a we made ourselves a definition of that when to choose uh, do a different option and then we will choose that home based care we will provide mild and moderate and um, we will uh, keep uh, patients um, uh, severe patients in a, in a, in a hospitals now in order to to have this decision implemented we have to do preparations and this mitigations what we have done is pro provide provision of supplies home based care patients so we decided uh, we, uh, we agree on the kits to be pro provided at uh, for the patients uh, um, who will be treated at home we agree with community health care we uh, pre prepared a home based care uh, uh, treatment guidelines for community health workers we trained um, home based care health workers um, and um, ensuring the supervision from health facilities medical staff so um, ensure that um, workers follow the protocols and we treat um, and we identified uh, patients uh, severe patients who required uh, treatment um this is also like a, we engage communities through our community working group we used to have a, have a um, community in communicating with communities cwc um, to ensure that uh, what we are going to do right now and when treatment are not available or when we have a, uh, all beds are full and our uh, capacities will be exhausted so um, this mitigation measures we have taken in advance uh, um, it, it was a long process long investment but that helps to win the uh, confidence of stakeholders including government next so briefly what uh, lessons learned for us uh, during at that time we understood that recognize the ethical dilemma unconsciously or consciously you will, might be you don't know but you are facing that what i am doing uh, right or wrong and if uh, wrong then what what are the ways to make it right um, have a, a evidence based options different uh, discuss different options with with stakeholders and agree upon the options available options and best available options uh, with uh, time place and person i usually say context uh, so it is a contextual ev evidence based options uh, uh, discuss and uh, agree options with various stakeholders which also include health sector cluster government uh, um, also uh, discussing with communities consult stakeholders uh, including communities uh, undertake uh, mitigating measures uh, um, depending upon your choice of options and always monitor and adjust uh, response uh, uh, accordingly um, finally i have a last slide uh, based on south sudan recent context uh, which is also giving you that um, some uh, next slide please dr mokesh we are running out of time please okay so the, <laughs> this is the last one i am saying and then um, you know um, uh, many of you including myself we are uh, paying for pcr test when you are not sick and uh, this is also like okay i am not sick but i am paying uh, why i have to pay for uh, for uh, test and and that's uh, what uh, happening in, uh, in in here in uh, south sudan airport uh, uh, some of uh, us uh, have to pay for the pcr and it is uh, like a randomly selected patient uh, uh, randomly selected uh, travelers mm, uh, that was not in the ministry of health who guidance but national task force which is is body wanted to implement uh, finally we negotiated and we came into the agree to have a monitoring mechanisms who will choose the patients and 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 then we ch change uh, testing not from pcr but to rdts and it is free of cost thank you over to you dr mukesh thank you very much for the presentation and sharing the experience now we have to revise our schedule we are um, late uh, we were starting the question and answer uh, session with some um, with this slido at ethics uh, sorry at ethics three so because we don't have uh, a lot of time um, we 
um, so you can post your question, uh, sorry, your question here. Probably you have already done. There, there is one question. Uh, I would suggest that this Slido uh, ethics tree remain open. You can post question if you have, or if you want to stay a few minutes more, we are here available for answering your question. And we will keep the question and then answering them in written and sending to you in case uh, we have questions that get an answer. So I think this was more like a comment. Uh, it does resonate. I think it was during the presentation of um, Dr. Schwartz. Uh, and it remind me the phrase, a wicked problem. And I think you have spoken about that when the mitigation itself caused some harm. I think if you, Dr. Schwartz, if you want just in few minutes, or oh, seconds, <laughs> just give a comment on this. And then we, I think we need to, I think we need to close. Yeah, I mean, I think that's exactly right. It is a wicked problem and we do have um, challenges like that. I guess sometimes we call them the, the, uh, the you know, impossible choices or um, uh, wicked, wicked problems or tragic choices. Um, and it, I think the, the the mitigation strategies and the strategies that we've just heard described um, by Dr. Mukesh is, is you know are, are so many of the ways that we can help manage it. And I think as as Eva said, don't try to do it alone. That's the that's the key. You don't have to do it in isolation. Look for help, look for support, and look for um, guidance, evidence-based and social guidance. That'll make a big difference. Um, I don't know if yeah, I think we really, thank that. you. Thank you so much. Is there anybody who wants to ask other questions? Uh, otherwise, I think we, we are over already a few minutes. Uh, we are going to close. Uh, I hope you find this session interesting. It has been a pleasure for us having all of you with us uh, and interacting with us and sharing your experience. Um, I just uh, the last um, things in the chat box, you'll find uh, a survey um, for this uh, webinar in which you can um, answer to a few questions. It will take three minutes. So please, if you can do it now before you forget about us or do it as soon as possible, uh, and please uh, send to us. It's very important because we want to improve and your comments are very uh, important. Thank you so much to the panelists and presenters. Thank you for the organizer, the translator, and all the participants. Thank you so much and hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again, if for those who are still online, if you want the recording of the presentation, you can you can send an email and we're gonna share it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
Paula, did you share the, the link I, with the survey? Yes, I just sent it on the on the chat. But if the chat closed, uh, like if people left, before we can clicking, send it via email. But I don't yeah, see the I don't see it. It's on the chat. Mm -mm. Yes, ah, I see. I see it now. Sorry. Yeah, can but this this yeah. chat is not saved. Yeah. Um, so I think we're gonna have. I can send you the list of the participants. Yeah, we can send it. Uh, and in then an you email. can send them. Yeah, you can send them that on an email. Let me do that right now, because I think you're right. If we wait, yeah, um, more you wait, and more it's really taking a few seconds, three minutes. Let me see. We They're went too long, so there were no question and answer. But I mean, it was. Imp I mean, the presentation were not that long, but uh... I don't think just some feedback um, for Slido. You don't need to wait that long. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think just like if you ask and then people start doing the prompts and you can go on mm -hmm. because a lot of people were, I think, like they did read the email and a lot of people were already logged in into Speedo. Mm -hmm. yeah. So maybe for next time, it just yeah. like managed to add in. Yeah, it's just I, I thought it was nice to see the question as they were coming. So maybe I'll I'll try to short the time, but uh, I think the presentation. I, I mean, I present. I was thinking not to present, but my presentation was really two minutes. Is that uh, when you say ten minutes, then it takes fifteen, and it's difficult to, and you cannot stop the presenter in the middle of their presentation. Oh God, the the. <laughs> The last presentation, I know it was not that long, but I was like, oh, the time is No, me like... too, you cannot imagine. I was like, you know, I had the, I have the, uh, let's stop recording. Can, can yeah. you stop recording? Yes, hold on. <laughs>